um, through those of you that are here and kind of give me an update on where you're at um, with your org reviews. Um, just so I have a sense. Um, so Kaylee. Back to Kaylee, Candace. Hi. Hey, Candace. Um, for, what was, can you repeat that again? So where are you at with your review? Is that the one where we're going to share why we're interested in the our organization? Yeah, it's the whole review. So it's the document that you have to fill out and the scorecard that you have to fill out and turn into Beth. So I haven't turned it in yet. Um, I just had a crazy week, but I do have what organization I picked. So, okay. and I was going to turn it in tonight after this. Okay. Yeah, make sure it's done this week. Okay. Thank you. And Candace, didn't you, you did the 990 analysis form on it too, didn't you? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Okay. And you said, I think you told me it got a pretty good score, right? 17. 17. Nice. Good. We'll see if I can confirm the seven. <laughs> yeah. Uh, right, thank you, Josh. Josh helped me a lot. <laughs> Good. Malcolm, you there? All right. We'll come back to Malcolm. Uh, Brenda? Okay, so I was able to complete my 990 form. Um, I submitted it to Beth and I started working on the other um, document as well, um, the review portion of it. And I also submitted that. I'm just waiting to hear back. And then I'm still going to be working on it throughout the week just to edit it and make it um, like doing more research on it. But I already started the form. Okay. If, um, if you don't mind, we might uh, have you sort of dry run it with the group so everyone can kind of get a flavor of, of, uh, of what to expect. Um, let's see who else is, um, uh, Beth did forward me three or four, um, uh, of things that were submitted to her. So she's, uh, she's out tonight, but she did forward those things to me. Okay. Um, Selenia? Uh, I actually completed almost everything. Okay. Have you turned anything in? Yes, I have. Uh, junior. Uh, yeah, I just started mine today. Um, I don't find, I was in busy all week, but yeah, I started mine on, it's called Children's Fund Incorporated. I should be done by today. I'm gonna do it after class. I should be done. And then I'm gonna get, um, since, yeah, I should be done today. Hopefully. Okay. All right. Uh, Kim. I actually um, finished everything. I just need to turn it in. My computer is updating, so it's taking forever. But as soon as it's done updating, I will email it to Beth. I'll email everything to Beth. Great. Um, Angelica? It's actually me, Priscilla. I'm on my mom's oh, Priscilla. computer. Sorry, my AC is loud. Um, I already finished and turned everything in. Okay. Okay. And are you prepared to uh, present today? Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't know. Maybe. It's nothing to be afraid of. All right. So now we'll have you drive. I don't, want, I don't want to go first. I don't want to go first. Okay. Can I go last? <laughs> All right. Um, Luis? Yes. Um. I'm kind of getting the 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 five ten steps that I need to take uh, for the points. I'm just having issues okay. of uploading because of my internet, but I should have it done by today. Okay. Uh, Fernanda. Um, I completed everything. I turned it in earlier today. Okay. Are you uh, okay with presenting today? 
Um, after Priscilla. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> All right, uh, Alexis. Are you talking about me? I'm just uh, I'm just an observer. Oh, you didn't do your assignment, Alexis. I'm a I'm a alumni. <laughs> I didn't know I had to. <laughs> <laughs> All right, you're an alum, so you're forgiven. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, Lizella. Yeah, I completed the 990 analysis. Um, and did you turn in, did you do the uh, org review as well? Yes. Um, how in depth did you want to go to, sorry, did you want to go into each question? Um, generally, they're in the, I don't know, three to six sentences. Okay. You know, for each question. I mean, you can always go more if, you, if it's something you're passionate about, but I don't want, you know, three word answers and, yeah, so, okay. But, uh, somewhere in the paragraph. So you'll be turning that in. Yes. Um, all right. Let's go back to um, Malcolm. Are you there? Oh. Hello. <laughs> can you hear me? I can hear you. I finished both the packet and the and the 990 analysis. The only thing I did, I did have uh, 16 points for my organization. I'm okay with uh, presenter first also. Um, I had 16 points on my organization, which obviously uh, likely to not be approved by the board. But I feel as if this organization is like they're, they're on the right track to, to progress and do the right thing, you know? Um, yeah, I mean, 16 isn't a, isn't a no. Um, so it's just a... You know, it's just a discussion on, on what makes it a 16 and how close it is, that kind of thing. So, yeah, maybe we'll use you as a guinea pig and then um, we'll, uh, you know, that way uh, the, the other ones won't be so um, shy about going after you. Uh, so I don't, I don't think I, <laughs> yeah, I don't, can you hear me? <laughs> I didn't have anything to say, sorry. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to call on you in just a minute. Uh, all right. And uh, Kaylee, are you there? Or someone else who's logged yeah. in, Kaylee? Sorry, I, I was out of the room for a minute. Okay. Uh, wanted to know where you're at with your 990 review? Um, I have started it. I just have to complete it. So th those of you that are here, it'll be very important that you get that turned in this week. Um, if we don't get it by the start of the next class, um, you know, you'll be at risk of, of not um, of having to drop the class. So that's not fun. Um, so, you know, this is your this is your one big assignment. So please, um, please take it seriously. Uh, all right. Malcolm. So uh, let me let me go to. There's only a tab here. Steve, I have a question. Yes. So the organization I picked, I really like, but um, there's another one I'm looking at. So, if, like, let's say I turn this one into you guys. Can I change my mind within a few days from now, or does it have to be the way yes? I and we it? we've actually had people turn in two. Um, sometimes they say, "Well, I'm not sure you're going to accept this one, so how about this one?" Or yeah, there's a there's lots of possibilities. The um, we can kind of talk through each each case as we get it. Okay. Thank you. All right, so no one needs, no one should be on GuideStar um, for the rest of the uh, next hour or so. Otherwise, um, we will knock each other out here. So, as we're sharing, so don't do your homework while you're in class. All right, Malcolm, what's the name of your organization? Uh, 
Charities for charity, sir. Charity for charity? Yes, sir. Uh, their mission is to make a significant difference in the lives of others and to inspire others to do incredible things. They fulfill wishes to individuals with life-threatening illnesses or traumatic in injury. Okay. So, uh, if possible, I want you to. I want to hear kind of your words as opposed to you know something that's yes. okay. You know, something out of their off their website. Yeah, that's just kind of give give me a sense of of what they do and why you picked them. Okay, I, part, part of it was a uh, personal experience, and then I see them portray uh, what I would have wished uh, someone did for my family during, during that. And it's uh, just the uh, one being the, the illness. Uh, I think one major thing about um, something that happens like that to that person, it doesn't affect them personally as much as it affects everyone around them that supports that person. So helping helping their family out with bills or like just just it, it's it's a number of things that that uh, they help with in terms of like uh, just daycare if they have kids uh, you know just just all kinds of different things that they help that I wish you know uh, I had during that time. So and was it a a, a pretty personal thing or can you share? You yes, know, what, what I, both my uh, parents died of cancer. So um, mainly my my mom, because uh, my dad wasn't in my life. So when my mom died of cancer, she uh, a lot of things that happened after her death that we didn't realize, like the house payments and the bill that was that was on us. Like <laughs> a lot of people don't realize, like what like all all of her bills and stuff they had. Like we we have we inherit those now. So that's like that's something tough to to go through. Luckily, my brother and sister they were. Um, successful at a very young age. So uh, my, my brother was able to buy my mother's house and we still own that today and he makes profit off of that. But like, uh, just like little stuff, like if he if he wasn't successful or able to pay those bills, we would have lost the house. We would have like, it, it would have been like a lot of things that, that would have happened, you know. And for some, like uh, charity for charity, if they would have seen that and stepped in like that, that would have filled I know my family's heart a lot or whoever they touch. And if, uh, how old were you at that time? Uh, I personally was six years old. My brother, his 20s, but he was already, he already did an enlistment in the, in the military. My sister was like, uh, uh, she had just graduated with her bachelor's and she was a fashion designer in France. So she came back home. My mom got sick and and you said uh, this did this organization step in, or is this an organization that is capable of stepping in? Someone who, who's able to do those things. Got it. Got it. Got it. Um, okay, so uh, let's kind of kind of walk through the scorecard here. So the first thing we're looking at is uh, program service revenue, right? So um, how many points did you? Um, did you show for that first first? Uh, what's that? Sixty points. Are you talking about for the first line? For the first line, yeah. Uh, three points, sir. Three points, yeah. Because we take zero and we divide it by anything, we get zero. So zero is good. Uh, that's three points. All right. And then we scroll down to the salaries. And what did you score on the salaries? Uh, also three, three points. Three points, because there are no salaries that are um, even uh, above seventy thousand. Right. Um, and you can see here that they're working, you know, five hours a week. You know, probably means they're spending a lot of their time doing volunteer work. Um, the president's not taking any money. The treasurer's not taking any money. So that's uh, that's a great organization there. Uh, okay, um, government grants. I uh, also scored three points. Three points because that's zero, and so zeros uh, gives us the, the top score. And then um, U.S. Organization. to domestic organizations. 
you also gave that three points. Sure. Yeah. And so those of you that, are, that can see this, this line that's line two that's grants to individuals, that's totally okay. Um, in this case, it's an organization that's giving to individuals who have needs or their families that have needs. Um, so we don't worry about line two. We only worry about line one. We don't want that to be too high because then the organization's just collecting money and handing it to somebody else. And then we go down to line 25. And what did you show here? Uh, one point. Yeah, so there... It was point three was there... Um, was there overhead? Yes, sir. Yeah, let me just see if I can figure out why. So what they did is they put their whole rent payment in overhead. And because they're such a small organization, um, they end up going way over on that on that line. Um, it's arguable that some of their rent actually helps to support their charitable purposes. So, um, so I don't have any problem with that, with that line. When you're dealing with numbers that are less than 200,000, um, sometimes the numbers can get a little, uh, skewed, um, by a big number here or there. So, and then the last, uh, the last number on the fundraising. I got three points for that. Yeah, just looks like they barely made it, like 0.09 something, huh? Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Fair. Very good. Um, so how was the experience for you? Uh, it was, like I said, it would have, it would have, if I had that in my family, I know that would have been like some weight lifted off. Like I just remember how how stressful my brother and sister were just because like that that house had sentimental value. So to lose something like that, it it would have like and, and to see how was the experience of being able to look at a nine ninety and kind of oh okay sorry judge I, I the whole thing. how it was how to measure the organization. Um. I feel like I don't understand it enough. Like, uh, okay. I see you uh, go in there and you're like, okay, I, I understand this and this is why this is, I, I I don't understand. I'm just following the, whatever the lines say and I don't understand it as much. Okay. Well, pay attention as we go through. I appreciate the honesty. Um, you know, pay attention as we go through everybody else's and hopefully it'll start, um, start making sense. I've been doing this, you know, a lot. I've done thousands of these, and uh, you know, over the last uh, sixteen years. So, I don't expect, um, you know, it can be. I guess I can probably be overwhelming to watch me do it because I can do it with my eyes closed. But um, no, it's. Uh, but do you, do you see the value? If you were to have the skill, do you see the value of being sure. able to do this? For sure, yes, sir. Knowledge is power. Sure. Thank you, Malcolm. Great job. All right, Priscilla, you are up. Okay. <laughs> my organization is called My City Youth Center. It's called what center? My City Youth. Somehow you're 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 blurring out there. Let me see if I can find you. Am I breaking up? It's my city youth. My cities. There we go. My cities like that. No, my city youth. There, the platinum one. I don't know why <laughs> I can't hear. Spell it for me. It's the second one, I believe, on the page. Uh, youth, yeah, youth I don't know if my computer is not that good. Yeah, that's it. It's not, I don't know. Yeah, that one. Yeah. <laughs> oh, aka My City Life Youth. In Hemet? 
Yeah. <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I'm old, so I'm hard of hearing. So apologize for that. Let's look at the night night. At least I'm not as old as Dan, so I always have that going. All right, so tell me about the organization, why you picked it, what it does. <clears throat> um, I picked it because I have a friend who works there. Well, she, um, she gets her time over there. And so I went to go visit, and I just thought it was so cool because they provide programs for children, which some of the programs are like arts, tutoring, dance classes, how to learn to skate. They do... Um, free bag giveaways, like free groceries every week. They do a prayer booth and their whole organization is Christian based. And so they teach these, they teach the kids about Jesus, teach them how to pray before they eat. And the whole organization is just super amazing. And I went to go visit and I just, I fell in love with the kids, like them just seeing they're smiling, like they're like showing me all their crafts, everything they've done. And so it's really cool. And so I really wanted to choose this organization because I thought it was amazing and to help out my friend. <laughs> is it uh Primarily like an after-school program? Yeah, it's an after-school program. Got it. Basically. All right. So let's see here. This is interesting. So I'm, I'm noticing a big change from last year to this year. Um, so just out of my curiosity, I'm going to bring up last year's um, just to see what's going on there. So prior to this year, they're showing quite a bit of this, what's called program service revenue, which means they're charging. Do you know if they uh, charge the parents? No, I don't believe so. I don't know. I think everything's free, I'm sure. Let me just go down to the, that part of the screen. Skipping over all of this stuff I care about. Yeah, so it looks like in 2019, they were charging some. 2020, all of a sudden, everything's considered a donation. But they're still showing it as program service revenue here. All right, so you, based on what you saw, you gave it three points for line one for the first thing? Yeah. And then how about for salaries? Uh, three points. Three points for salaries. And then government grants? Uh, three points. For government grants. Um, assistance to other organizations. Three points there. And then what did you show on uh, the fifth score? Uh, three points. <laughs> All right, so let's take a look at it. So, um, the fifth score is taking what's called 25C and dividing it by 25A. So 25C is 199,887. You with me? Hey, what? <laughs> Sorry. Was this for the 2020? Because I do the, I do the 2020. 90. This is the 2020. Oh, okay. 
20 um, points. So I, we, we got three points for the fourth item, which is grants to, to domestic organizations. So now we're looking at the last two lines of the scorecard, which are looking at the total amount of uh, overhead and the total amount of fundraising. Right? Yeah, I got two points for the second to the last column and then three points for the very last column. Okay, and where did you come up with two points? Honestly, I don't even know. I had up on it, and I just did what she told me. That's what I got. I remember right. how I did it. So grab your phone calculator. Okay. And go 199 divided by 385. Zero point five. Yeah, so that's that's fifty percent. And then what is the what is the rating tell us? How do we get to the two points? Uh, good question. I don't know. It should say it on the scorecard. Do you have it in front of you? You score uh, two if the number is between. Oh no. One point? Yeah, but how are you determining it, right? So, so how, how do, what do you have to score? What do you have to have that number be in order to get two points? What does the scorecard tell you? I'm stressing out. <laughs> okay. Let's, uh, let's go to the other <laughs> side. I'm not good at math. I'm confused. I had, a hard time. Time. I had a hard time doing this in the first place. <laughs> well, this is why we're doing this, to help you so that you can have comfort if, if someone says, hey, I wonder if I should give to this organization. All right, so I'm going to download the analysis form from the website. I'm going to pop it up here. Uh, zoom in a little bit. All right, so I'm down here. It says page 10, line 25C, third column code. Shows how much of their expenses are management and overhead. Divide 25C by 25A. So we did that and we got 0.5. So in order to get three points, it has to be less than 0.1. So if, you know, decimals may or may not be your thing, but 0.5 is basically 50% and 0.1 is 10%. So 50% is way, way higher, right? You with me? Yeah. Okay. So what's happening here is they're only going to get one point um, on this one because they're, you know, technically, I haven't looked at, at why, but their management expenses are half of their total expenses as opposed to just 10 or 15%. So we want, we want this number to be much lower than this number. They're spending more money on the management than they are on doing the good deeds that they're doing. See that? Okay. They're spending 199,000 on just keeping the, keeping everything afloat. And they're spending 185,000 on doing what they're supposed to be doing for the, for the organization. So I'm just going to look and see if I see anything obvious as to why. Um, they're paying $22,000 in interest. All right, so I'm just going to look real quick. This is not anything I would expect you to do, but I just want to see. 
if they bought their building and how much they paid for it. Looks like they bought a building. Did you say you went there? Yeah. And and so the building that they're in is it something that that is just a standalone? What's the what's the the facility like? It looks old. Looks <laughs> like it's been there for a while. <laughs> All right. Okay. So. Um, I find it interesting that they have zero dollars in fundraising. So again, as I look at this first thing, and again, this is not anything I would expect you to be um, an expert in, but it seems like they just randomly said, okay, we're gonna charge the parents that can pay. We're gonna charge them some amount. That's what they did in 2019. In 2020, they said, oh, your kid can come for a suggested donation of some amount of money. Um, and so they're kind of gaming the system a little bit here. Um, yeah, not that they're not doing great things. They're just kind of disguising what they're doing. Um, so the, you know, the question becomes... You know, are they doing just fine running the program by, you know, charging the parents that can pay, charging them uh, because they're spending zero dollars on fundraising. So they're not having to put any effort into raising money. So where is that money coming from? So I, um, I may contact them just because I'm curious, but uh, I appreciate you doing all of the work and um, overcoming your struggles. And uh, so great job with that. Any questions for me from anybody or any questions from anybody else? No, I don't have any questions. All right, um, who else did I said was the pick up? Fernanda? Yes, um, I did um, children's fund. Children's fund. And it's the one in San Bernardino. Uh, I'm assuming it's not Beverly Hills. Um, <laughs> I there we go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this is pretty big organization. All right, tell me about the organization, what it does, why you picked it. Um, so this organization helps vulnerable children. So by vulnerable, they mean like those in poverty, those who have been neglected or abused. Um, they help from birth up to 25 years old. And I chose it because um, I think it was personal for me. I grew up in, in really bad poverty since I was three years old. And I wish I was connected to an or organization like this. And um, they provide like um, bed, dental care, medical care. Um, and they even help with like with a bill if, you're re if it's an emergency, so. How'd you find out about the organization? Um, I was having trouble finding some, and like I found, I found one, and it did, it didn't meet the nine ninety analysis. So I found, I typed in Google like nonprofits near me, and I clicked. Oh, yeah. And this one was the one that like I was actually interested in. <laughs> That's great. So it was a pleasant surprise to find something that uh, is in line with what you like. Yes, because they were all differently. They were aligned with what I was passionate about, but this one was so. That's great. Uh, yeah, you can um, you can narrow that Google search a little bit and say you know children's charities near me or something like that, you know, and uh, poverty charities near me. But good, 
Um, all right. So what did you find out with the scorecard? Um, I scored 18 points, so it looked good to me, but. All right. Let's take a look and see if you're right. So no program service revenue. They don't charge for anything. So that's three points. Um, salaries. Um, one high salary, but only one. That's three points. Um, government grants. Did you do the division on this one? Yes, that was point um, 45. Um, you know, grants to other organizations is high, but not horribly high. It's 777,000 out of 3.9 million. Okay, so we're good there. <clears throat> And then looks like they squeaked by on the overhead, right? Yeah, 0 0.09. Yeah, 0 0.098 or something crazy. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Good. <laughs> good. Um, so the other thing that I'm going to look at here is it's showing that they gave away $800,000 to other organizations. So I'm just kind of curious as I kind of jump through this document and I apologize if your screen goes crazy as I do this jumping around, but there should be down here a list of the organizations that they give to. And again, these, these poor tax forms are just full of stuff that nobody cares anything about but there's a few things we do care about. Skipping, skipping. So there, a list of grants say, see additional data. I hate when they do that. All right, appreciate your patience as I kind of jump through this thing. All right, so here we go. So um, this is showing um, grants that they paid to other organizations. So oddly enough, they donated money to the County of San Bernardino, which is really strange to me. Um, interesting to know what that is. They made a donation, big donation to the Children's Hospital at Loma Linda, which is fine. And the San Bernardino County Department of Behavioral Health. So I wonder if they paid for somebody's therapies or something like that. They're just putting it here. Very interesting. Okay. Um, again, this is not anything I would expect you guys to look at, but I look at it. Um, so I'm just showing you. Uh, but there's other useful information in here that's valuable to some of us. Okay. Um, great job. So, um, does anybody um, have any questions about the process or yes. anything that I went through? I heard a yes. Um, yeah, I was going to do the same. Uh, I had my eyes on the same organization, nonprofit organization. Um, yeah, I'm okay if there's two people with the same organization. 
Just oh, okay. Make, make sure you do your own work. I oh, for sure, yeah. Yeah. Um, did we want to still go over mine, or were we going to hold off for next week? I'm going to hold off. I, I don't want to... Uh, we're at 7.15, and I don't want to take this particular module and divide it in half, because it's... it's um, important, I think, that it stays together. So um, you're, uh, you can breathe, um, and we'll, uh, we'll take you next week. OK, thank you. <laughs> All right, so we're going to switch gears a little bit. Um, I wrote this module about three years ago. Um, so it's still fairly new in the Giving University curriculum. Um, but I, um, I think I've told you the, the Giving University uh, partner with an organization called um, OC United, which works with um, aged out foster kids. And the Giving University uh, went out and bought a home in Fullerton and is um, letting OC United use it rent free for the purpose of having a transition home for um, 18 to 20 year old young men who um, aged out of foster uh, care, but had lousy parenting um, in the foster care system. Um, and as part of that, the Power Plus um, started thinking about, well, maybe we can hire some of these boys to work for us as a company and give them a chance to learn a trade and see what it's like to work in a, um, you know, in, in, in the, just see what life is like in the work environment. <laughs> and so they sent me to a class which was, you know, how do you work with um, adults who had experienced trauma as a child? And that was a pretty eye-opening experience for me, it led me down uh, a path to do a bunch more investigation and to write this module. And so, um, we're going to focus on um, homelessness, substance abuse, mental health. And, you know, admittedly, you know, I um, had thought, I had heard, heard people tell me that, you know, homelessness is kind of a choice. Um, have any of you heard that before? Yeah. yeah. Yes, I have. Yeah, it's, it's an interesting thing. Um, and I thought, well, okay. Um, you know, it may be true that, you know, they're not too happy being somewhere else, but I don't know. Choice seems a pretty, like a pretty active word. But uh, um, so I started looking into this thing. So. Um, question number one is, do you guys feel like homelessness is getting better or getting worse at this worse. point? Worse. 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 Yeah. Worse. So it's really interesting. Um, you know, all of us, is anybody not in California or spent most of their life outside of California? You're all California babies. So... California, you get to see. I'm not from California. I don't know if you. There you go. And where'd Kansas you grow up? Missouri. Okay, and in Kansas City, did, how was the homelessness situation? Terrible. Though? It's yeah. just as bad as California. You think so? Okay. Yes, sir. So um, I went and looked up some uh, statistics on this, and. Homelessness is broken down into three types of homelessness. You could think of it as short-term homelessness, medium-term homelessness, and long-term homelessness. 
So what do you guys think would be an example of short-term homelessness? Two months, a month. Yeah, but why would you be in that situation? Four situations that occur. When people kick. Yeah, so maybe you, you lost your job, you couldn't make rent, you're capable of finding a job, you just are, you know, in a short-term situation. So that's, that's short-term um, homelessness. What do you think about what would be a cause of something that's more medium term? Um, if someone is like struggling to find work or if their yeah, past they would have to lack uh, knowledge on how to, oh, sorry to interrupt. I'm sorry. They would have to lack uh, knowledge on how to use their financial resources. Because if they have a job, they have income, they need to know how to use that income so they can Yeah, the the one the example that comes up most often is like um, a woman who thought she was in a happy relationship, never really had a job before, and the relationship ended for whatever reason. And all of a sudden, this person who's never really had to work um, and was cared for now all of a sudden has to fend for themselves. Could be a runaway, could be a divorce, could be an abuse situation. Um, but it's not that they're incapable. It's just that they've never had to deal with it before. So it's going to take a little bit more time to understand, oh, how do I balance a checkbook? What is rent? How much do I have to make in order to make rent? What kind of place do I need to look for? What kind of job am I capable of doing? How do I go about finding a job? Those kinds of things. So those are more medium term. Um, um, Malcolm, you were in the core. Oh, we lost him. Um, a lot of times in the, yes. Oh, sorry, I didn't, I didn't hear what you said. Were uh, you in the Marine Corps? I'm sorry? Yes, Were sir. you in the Marine Corps? Yes, sir. So um, did you have uh, friends who were um, injured um, and or became disabled in some way and it took them a long time to figure out how to, deal with life with that change to their life? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, I, I don't know if I, I don't think I took the class. I think I told you personally, but uh, I know one person, he um, he only, he didn't really do anything wrong. Like he, he ate salad, he caught uh, E. coli and he lost his leg. And that was, that was a tough adjustment. I got to see firsthand of, of him like, just like coming to the realization that he's not going to be able to walk the same anymore or just like the natural things of life like that that was gone so yeah and even 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 guys that that get honorably separated from discharge separated from the service they were in high school and then they enlisted and then they were you know um in the armed services for four years and then all of a sudden they're out and, you know, they don't know how to look for a job. They don't know how to deal with, you know, they've had all their meals, you know, made for them. They just show up at the dining hall, you know, so it's a, it's a, it's an interesting adjustment for some, for some guys, uh, not even the ones that weren't in the war. So, um, yeah. Any other um, examples you guys can think of? Are you asking for the medium homelessness or the yeah. long term? Medium. I think the long term, we can kind of get a sense of the long term are the people that are uh, have some sort of near permanent um, issue, whether it's physical or mental or drug related, alcohol related. Um, and um, it, it's going to take a lot of effort to pull them out of homelessness. 
that would be the the long term. And there's many reasons why somebody would get there. So. I think medium. Another example could be, um, let's say, like a woman who lost her husband, like a husband or a spouse, and they don't have a lot of family. So then they're trying to figure it out. Like you said, like they're so used to relying on her husband, or he's re- used to relying on the woman, the wife doing the finances. So like when they lost their spouse. Now they have children and they're like maybe losing their home and like not knowing how to move on from there, but they're trying their best. It's just hard. Yeah. And they just need a little helping hand. So uh, hopefully you can see the the details of this. Let me change um, real quick to share just the slides. Sorry. Is that a little clearer? All right, so um, in this case, they've broken it down into two different types of categories. One's called sheltered homelessness and one's called unsheltered homelessness. So sheltered homelessness is uh, people that are in temporary housing but they have a place to stay. And unsheltered homelessness are people that are homeless and they have no place to stay other than maybe, you know, finding a place for the night um, or they're in, um, you know, they're sleeping on, literally sleeping on the street. And so the blue line at the top is, um, the total, and then the gray line in the middle is the sheltered, and the green line at the bottom is uh, unsheltered. So what do you notice is the trend overall of homelessness over the, over this, you know, again, the data is maybe two, three years old, but, you know, COVID kind of screws with things up a little bit. But uh, what do you notice? Which way is the trend going? going down it's going down if you're looking at the overall numbers but what do you notice about the green line at the bottom oh it goes down and up it goes down and then 2014 2015 it starts going up again so any idea what may have happened in that time frame that caused this change in homelessness? I want to say maybe um, wait, so the numbers obviously going up is more homelessness, right? Yeah, so it looked like we were making progress, making progress, getting people off the streets, and then all of a sudden flattens out and then all of a sudden it gets worse. So here's Steve's theory. Here's my theory. I believe this was caused by the opioid crisis. Um, The interesting thing about opioids is that they cause more permanent brain damage than than other types of um, things that that you can abuse. So if you abuse alcohol, um, then you can recover from that and your brain is pretty much the way it was before you started. Um, If you abuse opioids, even if you stop using opioids, prescriptions, um, Oxycontin, you know, all of that stuff. If you are at, if you use that stuff for a long period of time, you have altered your brain chemistry. And even if you get off of it, your brain is not the same anymore. And that's the tragic thing about that crisis more than anything else. And so we start to see more and more people living on the streets because there are near permanent changes to their brain chemistry. Uh, starting back when all that opioid crisis started um, 
back in 2014, 2015. Um, I have a question. Yeah. It might sound silly, but um, what's an opioid? Um, that's when people get, get hooked on prescription meds like Oxycontin. Um, you remember, uh, I, maybe, it, maybe it wasn't uh, front and center in your guys' uh, circles, but um, there is a set of doctors that we're making a bunch of money by um, prescribing um, very serious narcotic pain meds, Vicodin and, you know, I don't even know the names of them, Pregrazone, um, Oxycontin, those kinds of things. And people were, were saying, oh, I have this pain. I really need this. It's an opioid pain medication. So they get hooked on prescription meds. Um, and there's doctors writing prescriptions for them when, you know, they've never met the patient. That's what we mean by opioids. Does that help? Yeah. Okay. All right. So we're going to talk about uh, trauma. So we're going to rewind the adult life and kind of look back at um, what may or may not have happened to a person in the first five years of their life. So um, before we do that, let's, let's review a little bit on, on poverty. Um, because there's an exercise that I don't think we did. When you think about, some of you said that you were raised in poverty. Um, what do you guys think are the top reasons that have enabled you to not be in poverty or not as much in poverty as the next person. Can you like repeat the question again? Yeah, so if you think about what are the top three or five characteristics that enable you to be successful in life, to not be in poverty? Um, for me, I would say, like, I want to work hard for my parents. I don't want my parents to have to, um, they provided everything for, for me now. So I, I want to be able to take care of them when they're older. And a big part of that is like my family. So they've supported me and I want to support them. Okay. What else do you guys think? So if there was a, a poor African in the Congo that really wanted to work hard, you know, as hard as you do, do you think they could pull themselves out of poverty? Yeah. All it would take is hard work? And dedication. I mean, in the right mindset. Yeah, but what did we learn last week? What's preventing them from just going out and working? You know, are we are we just saying that all Africans are lazy because they haven't gone out and got a, gotten a job? No. No, of course not. They don't have the same resources and um, like connections that we have. Good. Okay, so it's some of those resources and connections that help enable us to be successful. If I took you and your hard work and your dedication and I dropped you in the middle of the jungle, all that desired wouldn't necessarily equate to you being successful. So, um, 
So the top three to five reasons that enable us to be successful are actually pretty surprising until you think about it. So the number one is where you were born. So the fact that you were born in California or in the United States puts you way ahead of somebody who was born in Africa or South America or Southeast Asia. Uh, number two is, you know, how much health care you had as a child. You know, if you were sick or you were starving, um, then, you know, that causes you to fall way behind, you know, other people your age. Um, and it makes it less likely that you'll be successful later in life. You know, number three is, you know, getting a head start on your education. And that has to do with, you know, your parents' dedication, not your dedication. Um, so what do we see that's in common with all of those three things? The thing that's most in common is that you had no control over it. You know, how many of you chose what city you were going to be born in? How many of you chose who your parents were going to be? Some of you wish you were, had different ones and, you know, that's <laughs> that happens uh, occasionally. But, you know, um, you know, they're, they're uh, the the number of people that have to overcome bad parenting is a much harder thing than the number of people that can be successful with, you know, coming out of good parenting. It's not impossible. Um, it's just that, you know, good parenting, um, you know, really helps all of us be successful. That makes, that's what makes us want to be good parents. Um, and, you know, providing medical care and education to our kids, you know? Uh, so the things that are the primary reasons that help us be successful are things that happen to us that we have no control over. Just things we need to be grateful for. You know, I'm grateful that, you know, I was born in the United States, that I had, you know, you know, a parent who pushed me and took me to the doctor and put me in preschool, um, you know, and if my parent hadn't done that, you know, I may not have been as successful um, as I have been. So anybody want to challenge me on that? Any thoughts? It's a different way of looking at it. You know, most people think, you know, exactly the way you do. That's just hard work and a good attitude. But um, it minimizes, you know, all of the struggles that people around the world go through. Because we would just say, look, if you would just not be so lazy, you could do this. And it's just not true. So we need to have a little bit more compassion for other people and be a little bit more grateful for, um, for what we have been given. Uh, remember, rich to the rest of the world is having two pairs of shoes, because most people don't. All right, so now fast forward again to homelessness and mental health and um, addiction. And we're gonna talk about childhood trauma and this can be kind of a touchy subject for some of us. So, um, you know, I'm just going to warn you now. Um, if you think that um, it may um, cause you to relive things that you don't want to be thinking about, then as we do this exercise, I just want you to think about somebody else, whether that is maybe one of your parents or one of your friends. Um, but um, if you have the 
the courage and the strength to do this exercise for yourself. I think you'll find it valuable. So what we're going to do is look at something called ACEs, which are called adverse childhood experiences. Um, I'm going to fast forward to that. <clears throat> so um, there were two doctors that were um, looking at uh, focused on on weight loss, and they noticed that they would have two patients that were doing the exact same thing. They had the same exercise habit. They were eating the same things, and one was losing weight and one was gaining weight. And they thought, how is that humanly possible? And they got connected with a, another doctor who was um, studying childhood trauma. And they created this um, ACEs study. Uh, and so they looked at a list of 10 questions. And so as you go through these 10 questions, what you want to do is give yourself a point for anything that you can say, yeah, that was true for me. And so, first question, did you have a family member who was incarcerated? And if that was true, you would score a point. Did you have a family member who was an alcoholic or a drug abuser? So you'd add a point if that was true for you. Um, did you have a family member who was attempted suicide or suffered from mental illness? You could add a point for that. Um, did you lose a parent as a young child, either through uh, divorce or death or being brought up in the foster care system, being adopted? You'd add a point for that. And then number five, was one of your parents physically abused by the other parent? And you'd add a point for that. So these first five questions aren't even things that were direct impacts on a young child. They were indirect, um, but they um, score the same number of points as the second set, which are the things that are more direct. So now let's look at the second set. <clears throat> um, were you physically abused often or very often, and you'd add a point for that. Were you often humiliated or insulted by a parent? So that would be more um, verbal abuse on a regular basis. Um, were you sexually abused, um, being defined as touched in a sexual way by somebody more than five years older than you? By the way, you don't have to reveal your answers to anybody, but um, it's just good to go through this exercise. When you were a child under five, did you often go hungry or have to wear dirty clothes? And then number 10, did you often feel that no one in your house thought that you were special or important? And that's, uh, we're trying to get at um, emotional neglect. So after you look at those 10 questions, um, you yourself will have a score or anybody will have a score somewhere between zero and 10. Zero meaning you grew up without experiencing um, any of these things. Um, I've never known anybody who's been a 10. I've met one person who was an eight, but um, most people are in the zero to five range. Um, I can tell you that I'm a four, um, and Steve Ray, who started this uh, organization, is a five. So, you know, we come from some pretty um, pretty tough uh, childhood uh, experiences. So what does all this mean? What do we do with these numbers? 
So we're going to look at some statistics, not necessarily saying cause and effect, but just looking at the numbers. So first of all, <clears throat> um, generally speaking, only one in three is a zero. So two out of three people nationwide across all, uh, they've done this test so many times and the numbers stay pretty similar. Um, so the only um, major difference being, interestingly enough, the, uh, the Asian culture um, tends to have lower scores, um, but um, everybody else is pretty much uh, across the board, rich, poor, uh, black, brown, white um, is uh, is in this distribution. So one in eight are four or higher. So if you, if we, uh, if you're, you know, in a work environment and you're in a team of eight or ten people, chances are one of those people on that team has had pretty major trauma as a child. Again, through no fault of their own. Um, things that happened to them. So if we look at the homelessness statistics, look at what happens with the chances of having to have been homeless at some point in your life. If you score a zero or one, only a 2% chance that you'll be homeless at some point in your life. Jumps up, you're a four or five, there's a 13% chance that you'll experience homelessness at some point in your life. And if you're six or higher, 27% chance that you will have experienced homelessness in your, in your life. So there's something here, right? Those are very, very strong correlations. Um, can't possibly be coincidental, but it goes beyond just homelessness. Um, if we look at statistics of people who scored four or higher compared to zeros, are three times more likely to be considered bipolar. So the people that originally thought that bipolar was a genetic thing that you were sort of born with, are now forced to look at it that, hey, this bipolar thing may have more likely be caused, caused by, by traumatic, traumatic events, events that, that where the brain, brain kind of takes brain. over and does some weird stuff. Uh, people who scored four or higher are five times more likely to be diagnosed with depression. So again, not necessarily, oh, I was born with a propensity to be depressed, but, oh, there's some trauma that if I don't deal with it, could lead to depression. Six more, six times more likely to abuse drugs and 10 times more likely to attempt suicide. And even if you go to the, the, the more milder stuff, work-related, school-related, um, twice as likely to be unemployed, three times as likely to miss work on a regular basis, four times more likely to have job performance issues. So this is pretty serious stuff. It was really, really eye-opening for me. Um, in some ways, answered a lot of questions. Um, and... Um, and in some ways can actually, um, you can even look at this and, and have hopelessness, or you can look at this and have hope, um, because <clears throat> if you're able to, uh, you or your parent or your friend are able to work through the trauma stuff, 
then these things start coming back down again. That's a lot of work. Uh, but at least there's a path uh, because trauma that can modify your brain chemistry um, can, in many cases, be undone. Uh, so it just takes a bunch of work. I shouldn't say just. It takes a bunch of work. Any thoughts on this? Anybody want to share anything? Yeah. As soon as you um, talked about the subject, I wanted to, I just, my mind started stirring up. I have two little brothers. And when you were explaining, you know, just, uh, it was so powerful what you said, like homelessness of somebody who has a place to go, but chooses not to, and somebody who just has no, like, doesn't have anywhere or, you know, so one of my brothers, he, he can stay in a men's home, but he chooses like to use it to be addicted and be in the streets. And my other little brother, he's, um, he can't get into the men's home because he takes pills and my parents just can't handle him. He's 23. Um, he's mentally ill. And so while well, I want to speak life, he's going to be free in Jesus name, but he has struggled with mental illness and, and, you know, he's struggling really bad and it's not by his choice. And a lot of the stuff you were talking about, how the abuse and the trauma, they both experienced that in my house. And I remember being a teenager witnessing the abuse and the rejection and the abandonment from their dad. And just everything you're, this is about is definitely spot on my brother's situations. And it's just, um, it's definitely opening my eyes too. So... I'm, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah. And, and again, hopefully this, this can be some, uh, give you some hope, um, you know, that, yeah. that, you know, Hey, let's look at, you know, what happened to you and acknowledge it and see if we can, you know, figure something out there. Right. I'm sorry, to, I'm sorry to hear that about you. Anybody else want to share? Um, I never had it. Uh, I only scored a two, so I I don't really know what it's like to be those people who score over four. But just like seeing these statistics, kind of made me think, like, dang, this happens so often, and that's a pretty sad fact. Yeah, and and. You know, just like when we just, just talked about poverty, the, the factors that make you most likely to be a drug abuser are things that happened to you, not choices that you made. You know, I always heard, oh, they got caught up in the wrong crowd. Well, you know, why did they get caught up in the wrong crowd? You know, because those are the people they felt most comfortable with. Why were they the people they felt most comfortable with? Because they were other people that you know, suffered and, you know, didn't get, um, didn't get their needs met. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, how the brain, you know, what, what causes the brain to do that. Um, just so that you can see that it's biological in the sense that it's actual part of your brain chemistry. So we're going to get a little bit into the science and I don't want to get too sciencey. Uh, but um, if you think about, you know, you walk across the street and you didn't see a big truck and a big truck's plowing down the street at 50 miles an hour and sees you and slams on its horn, what does your body do? Flight. <laughs> yeah, hopefully, <laughs> hopefully, you know, your body your runs out. Or your jewels make a run for it. Yeah. Or for some people, <laughs> or for some people, you know, it's what they call deer in the headlights, right? It's they panic and they stand still. You just have like so many thoughts racing in your head and just like, should I do this? Should I do that? 
And yeah. meanwhile, you're, while you're debating all these thoughts, the shuck is still coming towards you. Yeah. And, you know, you say you're thinking through it, but it's actually your brain is divided. So there's a front part of your brain that does the thinking. And there's the back part of your brain that controls the things that you don't have to think about. Whether it's breathing or, you know, uh, processing your digestion or, um, you know, as you're driving your car, you know, are you able to do a, a bunch of other things while you're driving your car? You can be chatting with a friend. You can be, you know, all this other stuff. You don't have to think about it. You know why? Because the back of your brain, you know, we call this muscle memory sometimes. The back of your brain has learned to, to kind of take over for you and allow you to drive or do your job or whatever it is without you having to think about it. You know, have you ever arrived at work and forgot, you know, that you were even in the car and all of a sudden you're pulling into the parking lot and, uh, and you can't remember, you know, having driven down the freeway. That's kind of what goes on with the front of your brain versus the back of your brain. So um, what happens with trauma is um, these chemicals that cause the response to trauma are great for your body for about 20 seconds. So um, like adrenaline, cortisol, those, those, those chemicals. If it's a, if it happens once in a while and it happens for 20 seconds, you know, you breathe heavy, you, you know, you thank God you got through it and then you get on with your normal life. That's fine. But imagine if your job was to put a blindfold on over your eyes and walk across the street all day long. Okay, what do you think would happen? You would, hundreds of times a day, you would have to figure out how to react to some car honking at you and you worried about that, you know, you're going to die. Okay, so if the adrenaline and cortisol stay in your system, they become toxic to your system. Your body starts rejecting itself. It starts literally eating away at your brain. They do brain scans of people with childhood with, with you know, ongoing prolonged trauma versus people that haven't and their brain sizes are literally smaller um, because the cortisol and adrenaline have eaten away at the corners of their brains. Um, and, you know, sometimes that's permanent, sometimes that can be undone. But <clears throat> what happens is when, when a child experiences traumatic events, their body starts reacting for them. Um, so, you know, there's example of, you know, a child who's abandoned, but then gets fostered by a loving family. And that loving family says, hey, stay here. I just need to run to the store. And they run to the store and 15 minutes later, they come back. And the child has freaked out because they assume they were being abandoned. They're like, okay, look, I've done this many times and I keep coming back. So if you think through it, you should recognize that I'm going to come back. But thinking through it is the front of your brain. And that child is never given the opportunity to think through it because the back of their mind says, oh, somebody walked out the door, 
I'm going to panic. They don't have a choice in it. Um, some kids learn to um, be manipulative. Some kids, you know, learn to uh, be abusive themselves. Um, so there's 15 different ways that the back of your brain can um, can create a response, um, none of which are healthy, uh, but all of which are at the point where the back of the brain is doing it without the front of the brain thinking through all the options and deciding the best option. So the most serious of these is, is something called a double bind. And the double bind happens when the person who's supposed to be your caregiver is also the person who's causing trauma. Because the normal healthy cycle is baby has a need, baby cries, mom or dad comes, says, what are you crying for? Oh, I see you need to be changed, or I see you're hungry, or you just need a hug, and then the child feels better. So there's that cycle that goes, and if a child feels that, then they grow up in, in a healthy environment. If the child has a need and cries and the caregiver doesn't meet the need or meets the need with a, with a, um, a contradictory signal like being angry about it or panicking about it, then the child doesn't feel that sense of comfort. That's called a double bind. So they don't understand how to deal with, how do I express a need if that need's not going to be met? Then it must be true that needs aren't met. And therefore, I have to figure out what to do, do myself. So um, I don't have like any kids or anything, but when I work in kids' world, I'll just like pick up some of the kids sometimes and they're just like, they'll just stop crying or I'll have them draw a picture of their parents and they'll just automatically stop crying and their whole mood turns around. Yeah. Yeah. So they, there are, you know, in their case that, you know, there's a way to help them with deal with that cycle, which is great. Do you ever have kids that, that that doesn't work? Yes. Yeah. They eventually kind of tire themselves out, but we try to calm them down as much as to our ability. And they're still, if they still don't calm down, we call the parents. Yeah. Um, and, and I'm not saying that every crying child, you know, must mean they have bad parents. Uh, that's certainly not the case. But, but, you know, if you think fast forward to somebody who's seven or eight years old or a teenager, you know, how are you seeing the same kind of thing? Well, they're not crying, but they're acting out in some other way. They're throwing things or they're punching somebody or they're, you know, being super quiet or, you know, whatever it is, you know, that may be a coping mechanism based on some trauma that they had at a younger age. Um <clears throat> So there's these things called mirror neurons. So if you walk down the street and somebody smiles, you naturally smile back. Um, if someone in, in the classroom yawns, you yawn. Even if you didn't see them yawn, you can be in the back of the room and watch the yawn go around the, around the room. It's not something you necessarily have to see. It's, it's these neurons that pick up things um, if you see somebody, if you're watching TV, I can't, I can't watch TV and see somebody get shot with a needle. I have to close my eyes. It just freaks me out because, you know, I just have that, you know, thing where I, you know, I, I don't like to watch a needle enter somebody's body. It just, you know, freaks me out. Uh, Every time so I see a needle, I feel like I'm going to pass out. No yeah. matter how small, I just feel like. I'm going to pass, pass out. out. Yeah. yeah. I, I have to I get, have my, to get blood my blood drawn. 
I'm like, I'm just letting you know, I'm closing my eyes. I'm going to my happy place. You do what you need to do and let me know when, when it's done. Uh, so, you know, but that's, um, and the, some of that is, is so if you watch somebody else, um, that's, that's mirror neurons. And so a young baby, that's how they learn. They pick up things from their parents. Uh, so trauma can be experienced even in the womb. So if a mom, um, you know, if there's an unwanted pregnancy, for example, and the mom is giving the child up for adoption, um, that mom could be, there could be one mom who's like, all right, this is going to be great. This kid's going to be loved by somebody and I'm going to carry this kid and then give it away. And they can in some ways be loving on that uh, baby in their, in their womb before they give it away. That baby will be way more healthier than the, the mother who gets pregnant. She hates the fact that she's pregnant. She hates the kid. She hates the, the baby daddy, she's angry, and she's going to pass all of those emotions to the baby in the womb. Um, and it's going to pick those things up through uh, through um, those mirror neurons. That's so incredible, Steve, that um, I know this stuff, but just to, for you to speak about it, I'm like, it's amazing how they literally pick that stuff up. It's so amazing to me. Yeah, you start putting all these things together, and and some of the yeah, I appreciate that because you know some people hear these things, and uh, but as I put them together into one module, you know, this the the goal is to give you guys an appreciation for people suffering for for from addiction, people suffering from mental illness, people suffering from uh, homelessness. Um, there's a good chance that some of these things are true about that person. Because you think to yourself, well, gosh, it's not normal to want to be on the street. It's not normal to, you know, want to just drug yourself to death. Um, but, you know, these young adults have different brain chemistry than than you and I do, or than, than, you know, the way that, you know, their body was designed to, to have. Um, <clears throat> so it can also be passed down through those mirror neurons. So, um, for example, you know, I'm a four, my child is a zero. So, I thought, well, gosh, my child should have all the things that I didn't have. I'm going to make sure I'm going to break the cycle. I'm going to make sure that there's no abuse or neglect. So therefore, they will end up being a very happy, you know, um, person with no fears and anxieties. And, you know, uh, that's not always true because my uh, fears and anxieties end up getting passed to the child through mirror neurons. Not my intention. Um, if I'd seen this, you know, 20 years ago, you know, I probably would have, you know, been careful about, you know, careful about it. You know, if you see this now and um, you want to make sure that you stop the cycle. You all have to be aware of um, figuring out how to resolve your own fears and anxieties um, uh, so that you end up with a uh, really healthy, uh, better chance of having uh, mentally healthy uh, children. So, <clears throat> um, I get in trouble for showing this, but I'm going to show it anyway. Um, in the Ten Commandments, 
second commandment says you should not bow down to them or worship idols. I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing the children for the sin of the parents to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. And so, you know, um, this, if you're not careful, sounds like, um, hey, because your parents sinned, uh, even if you don't, you're still going to be punished. But if you look at this in light of what we just learned, what do we discover? The sins of the parents, in essence, punish the children by causing them trauma all the way to the third and fourth generation. Um, especially those third and fourth generations if they don't come to to know and love God. So something to think about. I don't want to get into a theological discussion about it because I get, uh, I'm not a theologian, but um, my my goal here is is to get you thinking about things in ways that you've never thought about it before or put them together in ways that you've never put together before. Uh, Proverbs 12, 18, sharp words cut like a sword, but words of wisdom heal. Very true. Um, <clears throat> all right. So, running... thing? yeah. So, I grew up with like a lot of trauma and I wasn't physically abused, but I was, um, it was powerful the slide before you was talking about emotional like teasing and like humiliation. Um, my my family um, my family was very much like that even as a little girl. Um, like they'd call me the blonde or they'd say, "Oh, you sent Candace to do it." Oh, forget it. Like little things that they, I didn't realize that affected me so bad. I was emotionally um, what they would say. That's what messed me up so much was like the words. And like the humiliation and just teasing me a lot. So it, it jacked me up. Thank God for Jesus, though. Yeah. <laughs> um, you're setting me free. That's but it's just, it really, I, I look at it and I, I think back, like, why? Like, I didn't get physically abused. I wasn't really, my parents were good parents. But it's just, my dad's side of the family was very traumatically, verbally abusive to me. So. Yeah. And, you know, I, I appreciate you saying that, you know, you're becoming a believer, you know, for you that that, you know, that changed you. I, you know, I, I don't want everybody to think that, you know, that's all it takes because sometimes, you know, you know, you can become a believer um, and some of this, you know, God hasn't figured, God hasn't worked it out or you haven't worked it out. You know, it's sort of like, working out your salvation. It, not everything uh, becomes perfect, you know, the day you accept Christ. It's, um, you know, there are um, people of faith and people that don't have faith that continue to suffer through some of these things. Appreciate you sharing. All right, let's talk about... Um, Nonprofits that work in the uh, homelessness industry. But well, before we do, let me kind of go through this real quick. <clears throat> so let's say that, you know, out of all of your waking hours, half your time is spent, you know, at work or school, and the other half of your time is spent at home. And let's say that there are three possibilities. One is that that environment is healing. One is that environment is safe or neutral. And one is that that environment is um, detrimental or unsafe. So if at least one of those places is a healing place and one of those places is a safe place, then you'll have emotional growth. If one of those places is unsafe, like work is unsafe, but home is okay, then you'll be able to survive, but you probably won't be able to have emotional growth and you certainly won't look 
forward to going to work. Or if work is the safe place and home is the unsafe place, you won't look forward to going home. If neither place is a healing place, then your emotional status will slowly deteriorate because you'll have an unsafe place and a safe place, but it's not a healing place. And if they're both unsafe, then you spiral out emotionally. And if you don't feel safe at home and you don't feel safe at work, where are you going to go? You're going to go to the street. And this is the where the choose comes in, right? Am I really choosing to be homeless if I feel unsafe when I go to work and I feel unsafe at home? That's not really much of a choice. That's just saying, look, the only place I have any hope of feeling safe is being away from home, away from work, and either out on the street by myself or out on the street surrounded by other people that feel the same way because they've gone through the same kind of thing. So uh, we've kind of walked through the short-term, medium-term, long-term so if you have a heart for the homeless, you want to be thinking about, do I have a heart for the short-term homeless? Do I have a heart for the medium-term homeless? Do I have a heart for the long-term homeless? Um, if you have a, a heart for the short-term homeless, you can get involved in organizations that help people find jobs and provide quick transitional housing and overcome a crisis situation. If you have a passion for the medium-term homeless, then it's, you know, the, uh, the job training, the overcoming domestic violence. Um, it's providing, you know, six to 12 months of transitional housing. You know, if your heart goes out to the people that are bordering on permanent uh, or long-term, um, that is, that is, you know, that is great. You know, those people, you know, obviously need help as much as or more than everybody else. Um, but it's it's a long process, longer process. It's helping them um, not only overcome substance abuse and mental illness, but go back to the root causes if there are some of what got that got mm -hmm. them into that place. Otherwise, they'll fall back into it again. So, um, this is what I want you to leave, you know, thinking about, you know, is it possible that the back of our brain, without contacting the front part of our brain and letting us think about it, leads us into a state of mental illness or a state of substance abuse or a state of, of homelessness? due to things that we had no control over, things that happened to us, um, whether something in our early childhood or even something as an adult that caused trauma. Um, and if that's true of a large portion of the people in those situations, what does that say about our level of compassion for those people? You know, I was one of those guys that would roll my eyes when, you know, somebody came by while I was having lunch, you know, at Del Taco asking for a dollar. It's like, you know, dude, get out of my face, you know, go get a job. And after going through this, you know, I really look at those people completely differently. I ask them their name. I ask them their story. I buy them a, a meal. Um, I show them that there's at least one person who, who cares for them. Um, and it's really uh, had a, a lasting impact on, on. Uh, Questions or comments? I hope you guys found this valuable. Yeah. I have this, a comment. Go ahead. I just, I just thank you for this. And it's so good because it really helps you to rethink, even though like I have a brother that's homeless. I used to have that same perspective of like when 
they ask for money, you know, I'm like, oh, you know, and like now it's just, I mean, I've been different. I guess it's changed before, but this is more of like a eye opener of just how important it is to see, to, like to have compassion. You never know. Yeah. I oh, appreciate that. I hope, I'm glad you found it valuable. I know it doesn't necessarily touch everybody the same way and, that, and that's fine. Um, but that's why we, we could go through it. So, all right. Um, I'll give you guys the rest of the day off. Um, those of you that have not finished your reviews, please um, do so in the next day or two, get those off to Beth and we'll uh,